Welcome everyone. Uh, we are so glad that you're joining us today for episode three of the Snake River Dinner Hour. Tonight, um, uh, some of us are live at the Fall Robbins store in Seattle. My name is Lisa McShane and I work with American Rivers. I'll be getting us started today. We have live Spanish interpretation and the instructions for accessing that will be in the chat. Uh, this evening, it's a moderated conversation among a group of experts with our fantastic moderator, Alyssa Macy, asking questions. Tonight's topic is how do we provide clean energy without the dams? We're going to discuss the largest river restoration opportunity in history, the regional benefits of stopping salmon extinction, the impacts that restoration will have on the energy system in the Snake River region, and the solutions we can find together if we have the conversation. These aren't easy issues to discuss, but we're doing it here today. Future conversations focus on transportation and orca recovery. You can sign up for those webinars at snakeriverdinnerhour.com. And as we go along, you'll be welcome to drop questions in the chat or the Q&A, although know that this is a conversation kind of like a dinner party. So we might not get to your question, but our moderating team will be reading them and we will take them into account for future uh, conversations. And near the end, we'll have a dispatch from DC, David Mork, Senior Director of Wild and Scenic Rivers and of Public Lands Policy at American Rivers. will share updates on what's coming out of DC. And to wrap up, we'll have Mershka Ketchkesh, an organizer with the Sierra Club, share some opportunities to provide public input on this process. We're honored to have Alyssa Macy as our moderator today. Alyssa is the CEO of the Washington Environmental Council and Washington Conservation Voters. Alyssa joined WEC from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs of Oregon, where she served as Chief Operations Officer for the tribal government. Alyssa brings a strong background in political action, social justice, and tribal leadership. Thanks for being here today, Alyssa, and I will hand it off to you. So much, Lisa, and thank you for everyone for tuning in tonight for the Snake River Dinner Hour. I um, also just want to give a shout out to everyone here in the store at Fial Raven. Um, hello, I see the back of your heads, um, and you see me on camera. So this is really amazing. We have an amazing panel of folks coming together to talk about this issue. And what I'm going to do is just introduce their names. Um, and then you'll see their bios in the chat function. And the reason I'm doing that is just to give the most time possible for this discussion that we're gonna have today. So if we can get our panelists to come um, on camera. We have Nancy Hirsch joining us, Armand Hildebrand, Casey Golden, and Nicole Hughes. And their bios will be in the, in the chat function. And I'm just gonna, um, start this this conversation uh, to really just have an opportunity for folks to jump in, uh, carry the conversation forward. I see us less as uh, me moderating. I know that you will all uh, build off of one another's um, commentary. So as we're thinking about this, um, we'll just start out with a, a big question, Nancy. Um, how much electricity do these dams produce um, in the big big picture? How much electricity does are we actually talking about? Thank you, Alyssa. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the four lower snake river dams produce about a thousand megawatts of electricity. And um, that's over the course of the year. And at different times in the summer when the river is running low on water, um, they produce less. And in the spring, when the, the freshet is coming from the sn melting snowpack, they produce more than that. But on average, it's about a thousand. And so let's put that in context. About a thousand megawatts over the course of the year is about uh, the a consumption that the city of Seattle has. So um, it uh, that gives you the, the 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 feel of how much we're talking about, and and as far as how much it is for the region, uh, it's about four to five percent of the region's electricity, and uh, it's about ten percent of the Bonneville Power Administration, which is the uh, operator um, and marketer of the electricity from those projects. Thank you so much for that. 
Nicole, when we're talking about solar and wind as replacements for hydro, which is a lot of the conversation right now, people have concerns that when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing, they're not going to be able to have any power for their homes. How do we get around that without hydro? How, how, what is the solution that you're thinking of? I think um, first it's important to just keep in mind that all generators have limits. So there isn't a generator available to us today that operates 100% of the time. Whether you're dealing with resource constraints like um, on coal plants or the slow startup time or um, resource constraints on gas plants and the inability for them to operate in extreme weather temperature, there's always gonna be challenges to generators. Um, you know, with increasing demand on the hydro system as a result of, um, of climate change, I think uh, we, we absolutely need to try to come up with solutions that are less reliant on resources like wind and solar, the resource is free. Uh, it's not constrained by political or socioeconomic issues. Um, and, and generally, for example, solar projects, it's probably the cheapest type of energy to operate. There's really very low maintenance costs. So you have to think of the long-term um, life costs. But I think the, the real, when it comes down to how do we balance all of those renewable generators um, to maintain reliability, we have to look at the entire region. We have to be able to connect um, generators that that peak at different times of the year, different times of the day, you know, the sun sets an hour earlier in Arizona than it does here and the wind blows a lot differently in the gorge than it does in Montana. But if we had the ability to connect all these generators that um, peak at different times, they balance each other out really well. So regional markets is one way. Another way is to pair these generators with storage. Um, simple technologies like four hour battery storage will help take some of the pressure off of those peak times. That is really helpful. There's so much conversation about this and I think um, getting the facts out is really helpful for folks that are thinking about these issues. Armand, um, you're a fellow Oregonian uh, coming from my home state of Oregon and you've been a pioneer in this sector. Uh, bringing energy producers onto your farm directly. Can you tell us a little bit about your facilities um, and about your farm? Well, my facility is one of the smaller operations. Um, you know, this is a heavily regulated industry. Um, I came into the energy sector as a, what's called a qualified facility underneath the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act of 1976. That's a mouthful. But that, what that does, that allows me to sell my power to Portland General Electric, which distributes the power into homes for around about 2,500 to 3,000 homes in the Portland area. Um, I'm right down the road from you, Alyssa. Um, you know, I was, um, you know, the farm is right between the, the John Day River, the Deschutes, and the Columbia out there in the Klondike area. We depend on Columbia Gorge Wind. It's a nine megawatt facility, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I've, I've worked very hard at to get off the ground. And uh, I, I thoroughly believe that this, what we're looking at right now with the Lower Snake River dams and breaching these presents a once in a lifetime or not once in a 150 year opportunity for us. I'm excited about it. You know, I, I look at what's going to, what can happen with that freeing up of transmission capacity and how we could util, utilize that for expanding renewable energy. It's just, it's, it's an opportunity that we just cannot pass up. There's certainly a lot of excitement about this campaign and I remain optimistic um, about it, uh, really to see what are the possibilities. Um, I guess that's part of being a dreamer, right? Uh, Nicole and Nancy. The dams are critical to uh, critical for when demand for power has unpredictable peaks. For example, when demand climbs higher, super high for air conditioning uh, during the heat wave or industrial use or farm or a farmer has a sudden need for power. Uh, how do we handle that if the dams are removed? 
Well, I, I'll jump in first, Nicole. Um, it's about having a portfolio of options uh, that you can draw from. Um, you know, you mentioned a uh, peak in the, in the summer. Well, that's actually when the river is at its lowest uh, because snowpacks already come off. So we wanna make sure that one, our system is as efficient as possible and that we have the ability to move resources, uh, to shift them, to different times of the day so that we reduce that peak and that we use, a, as Nicole said earlier, a portfolio of resources from all over the region, including storage um, and including wind and solar and geothermal resources. We need to build that portfolio um, and uh, rely on, on um, uh, the different characteristics that each of those resources bring to help us address the peak energy needs that we have. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Nancy. It's a it's a portfolio. You know, we I represent mostly renewable energy developers and enthusiasts, but we feel strongly that a demand uh, side, a, a robust demand side is also important. You know, we used to talk about generating electricity to match demand. And in a way we need to start questioning how we match demand to meet generation. And so that might be knowing, you know, if, if customers were aware of when they're re when the generation is coming from renewables and when the generation is coming from fossil generators, that might be a good for, you know, place to start. I think there's also some significant inefficiencies in our electricity grid that need to be addressed. Um, outdated modeling, lack of investment in new technologies and antiquated contract provisions have really prevented us from using the system to its greatest potential. There's a lot of flexibilities and efficiencies that could be identified if we would just spend the time to look in all the nooks and crannies and figure out where they are. And I think that would help quite a bit. Thank I'd you. Also, um, oh, I could just jump in um, that, you know, we're changing the way the electricity system works. Uh, it used to be uh, there were big generators in rural areas and there were long transmission lines uh, into the urban core to provide electricity. And it was a kind of a one-way street. Now we're creating a web, a whole network of generation facilities that are across the region that are in people's homes. And, and it's a much more interactive, multi-dimensional, multi-directional system. That's more complicated. I, I understand that. Um, and that's why we need a transition period to begin to really uh, support people, support communities uh, in making these investments and, and, and support utilities in making the investments too. They need to be our partners in uh, helping build more community resilience with a more dynamic uh, energy system. One of the things that I've, I've heard is around the cost and how do we keep electricity affordable? Um, Casey, do you have some thoughts you could share on that with us? I do, if I could start by just chiming in a little bit on this last question too, since it's a dinner party conversation and everything. Um, and also just uh, a little note by way of introduction, I have a new hat that people on the call probably haven't seen me in before. Uh, on the, the Northwest Power and Conservation Council as one of the Washington members. And it's worth saying at the outset that Washington is still forming its position on the, on the Lower Snake River dams. The governor, I saw it in some of the chat, the governors and Senator Murray are, are in this process of looking at some of the very same questions that we're, we're talking about tonight. Um, and their, their decision uh, very much depends on those on the answers to these questions. So it's a, it's a good part of the informational process, um, but just kind of wanted to get that out there. And the, the other thing is to say that this question of how we replace the services of the dams, uh, you couldn't have uh, two better, three better other panelists uh, to answer it for reasons that just became obvious. <laughs> um, uh, but I, the, the thing I wanna add is that you know, we tend to go about our lives as if uh, the climate crisis didn't exist <laughs> um, and for, for obvious reasons. And 
I, I imagine most of the people on this call uh, understand and, and believe the science, uh, accept the science, I should say. Um, but we still, for the most part, don't really act like the climate crisis exists. Um, and we don't really have these kind of conversations in that, in that context. Um, so um, I, I just think it's important to recognize that for the salmon and for everything else we care about, um, it's not enough to just replace the services of the Snake River dams should they be removed. Um, if we don't rapidly decarbonize the whole energy system, if we don't rapidly electrify a whole new set of energy uses that aren't even currently part of the electricity system, then the salmon and everything else we hold dear are going to be in very, very tough shape. Um, and so we have to ask that question at the same time. Even if all we were trying to do um, was promote salmon recovery, you have to ask that question and look at this power replacement question in that context. Let me give you an example. Um, you know, before long, if we start acting like climate change is real and we're really going to solve it, uh, we're going to electrify everything. We're going to have a bunch of electric vehicles running around with big batteries in them connected to the grid. Um, we need to make sure those, those connections are two-way so that the, all that battery storage can help address this pro problem of one of the questions you asked about uh, what happens when you run the whole grid on intermittent resources that aren't necessarily available when you want them. So the answers to this, these questions are, are um, fundamentally different when you put in the context of dramatic, rapid system change that must happen to save salmon and to save ourselves. Um, the question of cost um, begins with the question of what's the cost of, of not doing it. Um, I will say it's a, it's a very different question than it was 20 years ago when, you know, forever we were looking at, well, if we, you know, if we have to build more coal and nuclear plants to meet our energy needs, that's gonna cost an awful lot more than the hydropower system. Well, the good news is over the last 20 years that the clean energy revolution has been launched. And now we know that energy efficiency is uh, cheaper than anything. And even new renewables um, are now cost competitive and cheaper in many cases than even the continued operating and investment costs of existing hydropower. So there's every reason to believe that there's a lot of clean renewable energy out there available um, to make this transition and to replace the services uh, of the dams. I mean, we'll, we'll wait for you know, more detailed analysis and, and look at it carefully, but we're in a, a much better situation because solar and wind have become so cheap. Um, and the final thing I'll add is that shouldn't uh, make us indifferent to the challenge of making sure that we use the power we have and the new renewables we're going to develop much more efficiently. Um, frankly, in the last power plan that the, the council that I'm on developed, um, there was a little bit of de-emphasis on energy efficiency. Uh, again, I think that's partly a symptom of, you know, failing to look at this in the context of a sweeping energy transition that brings in transportation fuels and all those things as well. The truth is we got a lot of work to do. New renewables are great and they're cheap, but they're not environmentally cost-free. They're not economically cost-free. Um, and so there's an even bigger premium on using everything we got much more efficiently and starting to develop um, demand responsibility that helps us to balance the system. I imagine my colleagues here will talk about that more as we go on. Thanks. Right. One, one of the um, uh, things that, that KC says that makes me... Uh, you know, raise another point, which is that there we have a we have a lot of decarbonization goals already in the state. Washington has the Climate Commitment Act and the Clean Energy Transformation Act, and Oregon has a clean energy standard and emission reduction goals. So um, the energy sector is all is driving towards investment in these clean resources. So the question is, is there enough to go around? And um, I think the answer that we've seen is yes, uh, by looking at the um, requests for new resources that many of the utilities in the region have put out 
and that are looking to get on the Bonneville Power Administration's transmission lines. The, the Bonneville Power Administration owns and operates 75% of the transmission in the Northwest. And most renewable energy projects have to pass through the Bonneville system at some point. Um, and so they have to put their, their, um, their marker out that they want a piece of that transmission. And so when we look at that and compare it to the output from these projects and the obligations that the states are putting on utilities, um, there are many times more resources uh, that are out there. The market and the developers are responding to the demand by uh, putting a lot of projects out. Not all of them will get built, but there are so many more available than what is needed um, that I'm confident the best mix of them will be developed so that we can optimize the system as effectively as we need to in order to meet our needs. And I wanted to add that there's some really good news about this, and that is the immense economic opportunity for the rural communities in our region with these projects that need to be built. I mean, the the county that Ormond comes from is a perfect example. Uh, Sherman County in Oregon used to be the poorest county in Oregon. And now I believe, if I pull up my number right here, um, they receive about um, $150 million. $150.5 million so far in property tax revenue from renewable energy generation. And that makes up 18% of their county's budget. And in nearby Morrill County, one or 38 out of a thousand of people employed in the county are working on renewable energy projects. And we haven't even touched the capacity that we could we could meet here. And you know, all, all of these new projects are gonna bring new jobs into communities that have been historically depressed when the aluminum industries went away and timber harvesting went away. And now with the conglomeration of commercial farming, we have a lot of far family farms that have, have not survived. And the great news about renewables on farmland is that, um, you know, one in four family farms has to require ha, or requires off farm income just to make it work. Now, this is a way to bring the income on the farm. You can generate renewables on the land that is least productive. You can uh, keep that income on the farm and you don't have to go out and get other work and it, and it keeps you competitive and you don't have to sell out to the large conglomerate. So there's all really good economic stories here as well. We also have a a substantial um, need to employ uh, direct labor for the, the maintenance of the equipment, but also to the indirect, indirect services. Um, you know, my little facility um, employs people from Boise to Medford to some of the uh, Alaska natives at the Cook Inland in uh, Alaska for a variety of ser services from IT work to legal to accounting. Um, I, mean, if, I, th I think the University of Minnesota, Oregon State, um, NREL, all have done studies on this economic multiplier You know, for small projects that can be up to uh, a mul multiplier of three times for lar larger, it might, might be two times. It is, it is really significant to a small county like Sherman County. It enables us to invest in our schools. It, you know, it buys fire trucks. It gets, a, gets us an ambulance and pays for the, the sewage facilities. It's critical. Yeah, I mean, the research we did in Oregon, we just um, pulled some numbers together. And for every dollar that is spent directly on renewables in the state, a dollar 62 is spent indirectly on all of these other things that Ar Armand has been talking about.
I'm just over here imagining I'm eating dinner. Uh, <laughs> I hope all of you out there are eating something. Um, I, I have a, well, first of all, just thank you for sharing that information with us. It's really helpful to hear from experts in this space and, and to talk about this in a way that um, I think that I can receive it and understand it. Sometimes when I'm sitting in these conversations, it starts to level up at a, at a language where it doesn't always make sense to me. So I, I appreciate um, how you're sharing this. I, I have a question. This is just a, a big picture question. We talk about hydro all the time and we hear that dams are clean energy. And I would be curious to hear from each of the panelists, um, your thoughts on that. Is that true? That's well, a, you're up, Orma. I, I I may be a little bit um, prejudiced on that answer uh, on that question. Um, I can I can still remember when I was a little kid, Slano Falls, um, and so my answer would be that it, it has to be conditional. I mean, yes, it has some clean energy to it, but we've done a lot of environmental damage also that we'll, I don't know if we will ever recover from. Um, go, go ahead, Casey. Yeah, you were about to in. Um, yeah. I would say, I, I would maybe not answer your question directly, Alyssa. I would say um, nothing is benign um, and uh, everything has impacts. Uh, we have to be um, thoughtful about where we build our resources and um, smart about how we put our new resources together. Um, as we are gonna build new, a lot of new resources. And um, hydropower is a very important part of our energy system right now. And um, the conversation we're talking about is, is about four very specific pro hydro projects. Uh, not the, for me, not the entire hydroelectric system because I, I think we need the hydroelectric system uh, and uh, because it is a it is provides a tremendous amount of, of energy and it helps support our renewable energy system uh, and as a renewable energy resource itself. Um, so for me it's a more nuanced response um, and um, the cultural impacts uh, are are tremendous and heart-wrenching. And I want us to be smart about all of the future resources we're gonna build and take cultural impacts and environmental impacts and wildlife impacts in, uh, into account upfront. So we don't uh, continue that legacy. Yeah. Yeah, I wanna second what Nancy said. I, you know, just being completely honest, all, all development projects have impacts. I think the today when you go to develop a new project, you go through years of environmental analysis ahead of time. You do two to four years of pre-survey AVN studies and years of monitoring afterwards. Some of our original energy projects were built without any consideration of environmental impacts and zero consideration of social justice impacts. And you know, I'm not here tonight to say whether what should happen to these specific resources. I just think going forward, we need to be very um, discretionary in our choices of building and investing in new resources. And the hydro system itself is the backbone of our energy system here in the Northwest. We absolutely need it, but we do need to be very discretionary in going forward. Yeah. Um, let me thank fellow panelists for some truly great answers um, and and second third fourth I guess <laughs> this the uh, the answer that you know the, the the cultural and physical impacts of the whole hydropower system are enormous and sad and um, you know it's it's part of why we're here um, having said that your question 
you know, the question is around the word clean, and that might be part of the problem because clean is often um, used interchangeably with sort of um, non-fossil fuel or, um, you know, non-emitting. And uh, I, I think that's a little bit confusing. It's a good sign that I think people are starting to take um, the climate challenge a little bit more seriously. And as we look at you know, what words should we use or what should we be looking for in our energy resources in the future? I think that the first and most important thing is that uh, we need to move beyond fossil fuels. That's an absolute. Um, after you get beyond fossil fuels, well, what about everything? What about all the other choices? If it's not a fossil fuel, is it a free lunch? No. <laughs> um, all these other things, as Nicole said, have impacts as well. It's another reason why energy efficiency sort of rises to the top is because it's the lowest impact. But um, it just because it's a fossil, not a fossil fuel, doesn't mean it's environmentally cost free, which is kind of what we think of when we say when we say clean. And these dams, in particular, have an environmental legacy that is, you know, just cuts to the root of uh, this region's, uh, you know, environment and culture. And it's why we're we're having this conversation, why it's such an important conversation. I will say so, that some opponents of dam removal um, lean heavily into the fact that how can we be serious about climate change and about transitioning, decarbonizing the energy system and thinking, think about taking out these carbon-free resources? And I wanna say it's, it's, a, uh, it's a fair question. Um, some of the people who are asking that question are a little bit new to the climate fight, but I'll take it. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think we can uh, move forward in any direction responsibly without, without asking and answering that question. It is an existential challenge. It is fundamentally different from uh, many of the other environmental challenges we face where we you got to make hard, hard trade-offs, you got to make sure that resources are cited effectively, um, all those kind of things. With fossil fuels, you know, we got we got eight years, according to the international scientists, to cut our emissions in half. We absolutely can't be developing any new fossil fuels, and we got to be winding down what we have as as quickly as we can. So the folks who are saying, "Hey, what about the climate trade-offs with this?" I just want to tell you, I I uh, I uh, sympathize with that question. Um, and it's a question that I, and I know the governor is going to be, um, you know, really uh, 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 insistent about answering effectively and um, addressing as this, this question moves forward. So, you know, I, I would also um, add to this conversation, the idea of more conversation, right? The, the, the benefit of this, th these are, tricky issues, these are complicated, this is a complicated um, um, transition we're trying to go through. And the more dialogue we can have uh, early with uh, impacted communities, uh, with tribal nations, with the utilities, with energy providers, where we talk about what are your fears? You know, what, what, what are you worried about? What can we, well, how can we address that? How can we solve that? Let's talk about what you need uh, in order to get to the other side of the equation. And, and I would just um, say, Casey, also it is because of climate change mm -hmm. that we have to move on these projects because these, the um, cold, pristine waters, uh, headwaters that they're going for, are that give them the best shot at survival. Um, so it is, you know, yes, it's because of climate change we can't take them out, but also it's because of climate change that we may have to, and that that's a key that's a key piece that we cannot ignore in this conversation. Yeah, thank you for those honest answers. I think that's important for us to, to talk about all of that recognizes the nuances of this. This isn't a simple answer, and it's going to require the, the good thinking and planning and discussing with a, a lot of people. I did hear you mention, Nancy, um, asking the questions and, and getting information out. And, and I just want to go back to a question I asked earlier about affordability and keeping electricity affordable. Um, I read in the Tri-City Herald that the power rates will double in 
by cities if these dams are removed. And I would love to hear your thoughts about this. I want to understand um, where that thinking has come from and whether or not that is a, a true statement uh, for folks that are thinking about paying your Um, uh, apologies, Alyssa, you were cutting out, but I, I think I got the gist of, um, of your question. And, um, you know, one of the things that we, um, will, will there be a cost? Yes. Um, do we know, uh, is there a cause? Casey said, we have to look at the cost of doing nothing and the cost of the status quo. Uh, these are aging hydroelectric projects. They will require more investment over time to maintain them. We're already investing a lot in salmon and steelhead recovery and fish and wildlife mitigation uh, across the region because uh, in part of these projects. So there are costs to include in that uh, equation that affect power rates from the Bonneville Power Administration. Um, and I think the, the other, uh, I, I can't comment specifically on what the Tri-Cities costs will be. Um, every utility has a different um, cost structure with uh, what, where they get their power, uh, if they're a, even if they're a Bonneville customer, whether they're, they're only a Bonneville Power Administration customer, whether they have other resources of their own. Um, what I can say is, we have to plan for this transition, right? We know how to do utility system planning in this region, and we know how to replace resources uh, or add new resources. So once we make a decision that we're on this path towards salmon recovery, and, and what is it that the, that the fish need uh, in a free flowing river, then we can start to map out the transition and the, optimize the re replacement resources that we're going to need uh, to replace these services. Um, so, and that that's a that's a five to ten year conversation and planning. And what those resources are going to cost in five years, uh, I don't. I, I'm I'm assuming they're coming down. We've looked at the at the data, which shows that the costs have already dramatically uh, reduced. So I think they're still on the path, particularly with storage, which is declining in costs rapidly. The cost of replacement will be even, even lower cost. Um, so, but I can't say today exactly what it's gonna mean for customers' bills, uh, because I don't know what the replacement mix is gonna look like. You know, this, <clears throat> argument about making changes to our energy system and the the fear mongering over rate increases uh, really perplexes me because we have been replacing aging infrastructure all across this country forever. And it hasn't been like when one bridge goes down, all of a sudden, every single taxpayer in the city gets charged with a thousand dollar bill. You know, I grew up in Oregon and remember when we decided to take Trojan down and there were people at the beginning saying that is going to kill us. We are going to pay double the electricity rates and that didn't happen. And when we were trying to pass the original RPSs in Oregon and Washington and everyone said your electricity rates are going to double. Well, they haven't. Um, those are facts. And so I you know, also just want to remind people that the rate making process, both with public and private IOUs, is very complicated. So every year, for, ex or for example, BPA goes through a rate case and they have a public process and negotiate around um, a very complicated system of agreeing to rates. They also have long term contracts with their customers that protect them from certain types of unnecessary rate hikes related to infrastructure. So I don't think it's realistic to think that if there's one change to our infrastructure in this system, it's going to result in massive changes to the rates we're paying now. I can tell you one thing is if we don't start making some investments in infrastructure now, the rates will be higher. And the reason is because 
we have growth in our in our economy. We are electrifying things. There are more people. There's more demand on the electricity system than ever before. There's data centers running 24 hours a day, Bitcoin miners using up all sorts of electricity. And we have to invest to make sure we have that robust system to keep the costs down in the future. We also have a, 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 a lot of um, independent power development companies, you know, everyone from Avangrid to uh, Cypress Renewables to uh, Bright Night Solar, down to little, little guys like me who are chomping at the bit wanting to wanting to get going. Um, you know, I can I can I can I can probably double um, the amount of generation that I have for my facility right now with very little cost um, if I'm allowed to do it. Um, everything else is designed out for it. All I have to do is apply some solar panels to get some batteries at a two hour uh, energy shift. Uh, I'm in business. I can do that with a very low cost. Um, I know Avangrid and others who are looking at the same issues. Um, it's a very competitive industry and they're gonna drive, drive down costs. I'll just add, just because of the way you asked the question, Alyssa, just, you know, keep it in perspective. I mean, it's this, this is a meaningful amount of power, but Nancy was saying at the beginning, it's what, four or 5% of the regional system, 10% of the Bonneville system. It's not nothing, but, you know, doubling rates sounds like uh, a little bit much. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a controversial issue. So you're going to see a lot of you know, um, claims going back and forth. And I, I just really second what Nancy said about, let's sit down, put the best minds to it, to get everybody's, you know, really legitimate concerns at the table, figure the cost won't be zero, they won't be double your rates, let's figure out what they are and what we're going to do about it. And once again, they figure out what we're going to do about it in the context of the other big changes we need to make to our energy system in the context of, you know, having electric vehicle battery storage available and all the other things we're gonna we're gonna need to do. Um, we're gonna optimize in a changing world. We're not just, you know, if we if we make this decision, we don't the analysis can't be, well, you know, if we stand in the middle of the road and let the truck run us over, will it hurt? <laughs> um, that's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna the system's changing. We're gonna adapt and think of the best ways and let's do that analysis and see where where it leaves us. Really appreciate all your thoughtful answers. Um, definitely want to give a shout out to all of the questions that folks have been sharing in the chat. Um, we're going to answer some of those in the chat function because we've uh, we're at time for this conversation. So I just want to invite Lisa back um, on to hand this off and look for some of the answers in there. But there was one thing that caught caught my attention really quick was the comment by Linda Golly, you can replace the power, but you can't replace salmon. And, and I think we all here in the Pacific Northwest care very much about Waikanish, about salmon. Um, and I think that's what's pulling a lot of us together in this monumental effort and the largest dam removal campaign um, underway. So thank you for being here and Lisa. Oh, thank you all. That was such a great conversation. Um, and uh, in the Q and A, um, uh, Nicole's been answering questions, so feel free to dive in uh, during our next section and answer some of those questions. Um, and uh, now I'm going to bring uh, David Morick on um, to talk a little bit about what's happening in DC. Great, David. Nice to see you this evening. Um, and I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about uh, what the conversation is looking like in DC. And who are the key players who uh, might need to hear from their, might want to hear from their constituents? Sure. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks again to the panelists. And by the way, um, behind me is the Imnaha River. I live in Portland, Oregon, and uh, had the pleasure when my son was one, I'm, he's now six, to hike up to what's called the Blue, the blue Hole and see uh, salmon who have had traversed the Columbian Snake and, and were heading up into the wilderness there it was a pretty magical place they're all miracles but that one especially hearing your son pointing at the fish and <laughs> babbling about uh about fish so yeah there's there's a lot going on as you can imagine um 
a lot of attention. I think it was it was mentioned. I think Casey mentioned the 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 Murray Inslee. I guess I'll just start by saying there are kind of three key areas uh, that I'm going to focus on briefly in the next few minutes. Um, the first is the uh, Murray Inslee Initiative. Folks had referenced it, but those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, Senator Murray and and Governor Inslee announced the process. Um, to, to basically assess whether there are reasonable means for replacing the benefits provided by the lower Snake River dams. And we're in the midst of that process. They're in a, they're, um, they've hired some consultants who are developing a draft report that they're gonna release for public comment in mid-May. And then they're gonna take public comment till about the middle of June and issue a final report um, at, to the, you know, sometime in the middle or end, end of July. And I'll, I'll include in the chat, a, or it looks like someone's already beat me to it, um, a couple of links to, um, to learning more about that process. But that's really an extension of a lot of conversations that are going on across the region with different members of the congressional delegation about this issue, diving into the specifics of irrigation, transportation, energy replacement, like we've been talking about here. The second area I wanna focus on is the Biden administration. Just last month, um, the uh, Council on Environmental Quality pulled together an inter interagency working group of uh, whether it's BPA, Department of Energy, uh, Department of Interior, to basically assess to assess how they can engage in in a, a process to identify a durable path forward that includes a lot of the elements we've talked about here: clean energy future support for local economies and restoring ecosystem function. And that was directly a result of a tribal uh, nation consultation and meetings. Um, we've talked a lot about energy and the, and the tri I just wanna mention that the tribes have, have been really leading uh, this issue in so many ways. And I think are soon to release a, a tribal energy vision. Um, so something also to keep, keep our eye out for. And then one last thing in closing, the, um, uh, I think it was put in the chat, American Rivers recently with along uh, with Washington Environmental Council released uh, our most endangered rivers report and the Snake River was um, the second most endangered river and you can learn more about how you can take action and get involved in the link that I think is provided uh, in the chat. And if it's not, I'll make sure to add it. Thank you, really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna bring uh, Mariska back on and while she's turning her camera on, I've got to mention that behind me is a painting of the Horse Heaven Hills. Uh, I'm from the Tri-Cities um, that uh, rode up a McBee Road uh, to the Horse Heaven Hills is one of my favorite spots in the world. And uh, Mariska, uh, can you share some opportunities for how people can provide input on this issue? Yeah, of course. So, um, hello, everyone. Again, my name is Marisha Kachkesh. Um, I'm an organizer with Sierra Club with the Washington chapter. Um, and so, yeah, there's folks have already kind of mentioned a few different links that have been um, thrown in. But, um, you know, building off what David was saying, checking out the um, lsrdoptions.com is that sort of official page. Um, that's having updates on the Murray Inslee process. Um, and in particular, one input that process that you can do now is if you scroll all the way to the bottom of that page, um, there's a survey that you can fill out that asks questions about a whole slew of topics and interest around the Snake River, whether you're really involved in recreation or the energy question or agriculture. They You don't have to answer all the questions, but it, it is an opportunity to provide input right now. Um, theoretically, the game plan that we've heard is that in mid-May, a draft proposal will come out. And so um, there should be a, a public commenting process on that as well. So you'll definitely be hearing a lot about that um, at our next webinar. And then the last opportunity, you know, speaking of energy, if we want to stay thematically, is that you can also and should also email your utility provider um, and let them know how you feel about the Snake River dams and how, you know, what does what does clean energy mean to you and um, how, you know, express that the need to value salmon as a part of that equation. Um, if you are uncertain of where your um, utility is or who your provider is, I'll drop a link in the chat if it hasn't been dropped yet that has all the providers in Washington at least. 
Um, and if you're unsure of who to contact, um, many utilities have a board of directors that are great people to let know how you feel about the Snake River dams. Um, and if you can't find that, you can always reach out to the general manager CEO of the utility as well. So um, it's always good to, to let them know how you feel about where your electricity is coming from and where you think it should come from. And that's, that's what I got from my corner. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Mariska. Um, so in our last uh, seven minutes, um, which I think is plenty of time, I'd like to invite our panelists and moderator, moderator, moderator Alyssa <laughs> uh, back on to share any brief, uh, just to share some final words uh, to close us out. Um, here are your last thoughts from probably from each of you um, with seven minutes left. Thank you. I'm happy to jump in really quick. Um, first of all, just again, thank you to all the panelists for being a part of this conversation today and sharing your thoughts and expertise. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone that is uh, zooming in to our program. Um, I hope that you have learned something and are excited to be engaged. And also just a big shout out to Fial Raven and the folks that are in person in attendance here at the store. We really appreciate you showing up. You know, I, I shared with somebody today that I consider a mentor um, why I do this work and, and how, how deeply I care about the environment. Never considered myself to be an environmentalist. I'm just a, an Indian woman uh, walking in the knowledge that's been shared with me. And um, I think about Waikanish salmon all the time um, as it's related to our culture and it's important and it has so much tied up with our, our cultural and spiritual um, existence. And Armand, hearing that you saw Salilo Falls like almost brought me to tears because that's where my people were from. And I may never see that in a lifetime. Hmm. How does that impact me as a, a Native woman? I think about that all the time. So I just, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I appreciate people showing up and sharing their different perspectives because this is a conversation that we need to have together. We need to walk forward together um, and, and ask the hard questions and put our good hearts and good minds together to find the solution. So I'm, I'm optimistic, um, I'm here and uh, a part of this work and, and I show up every day because I, I feel this work here. Um, I think about it here, but I feel it here in my heart. So just thank you and pass it off to whoever else would like to share some closing thoughts. Alyssa, thanks for hosting us and, and fellow panelists. Good, good to be with you and to all the folks who joined. Um, I just love and appreciate the spirit of this conversation, the spirit that you just exemplified, Alyssa. Um, and I guess the thing I'd, I'd just uh, leave you with is, um, you know, especially when it comes to energy stuff, uh, everybody's a little change averse, you know? Um, utilities, I think, and the energy system is conservative, small C conservative by nature because uh, people don't like a lot of disruption. <laughs> people like the lights to stay on and the bills to stay low and move on to the next subject for the most part. And that's all really understandable. And I, I just, I guess I'd urge us to uh, lean in with open arms a little bit more to the fact that truly enormous changes are upon us in the objective physical circumstances of our existence on this planet. Um, and we can't meet them with our arms folded you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, resting on the laurels of New Deal era investments in, in a cheap federal hydro system. Um, we're gonna have to drive this change. We're gonna have to engineer this change. We're gonna ask, have to ask tough questions like this. And, and the consolation is it brings with it enormous opportunities, opportunities to redress some of the um, damages of the past culturally and physically, um, economic opportunities that Orman was talking about. I live in a rural county and the opportunity to replace uh, 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 extremely expensive oil from Russia with uh, cheap, clean power from my rural co-op to power my car uh, is an enormous opportunity that I'm looking forward to. And um, you know, these, these changes are, are with us whether we invite them or not, our only choice is um, you know whether we engage them and face them with 
open hearts and our best minds and, and lean in and create our future. So thanks for creating a space to talk about all this stuff. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Alyssa. Yeah, thank you, Alyssa. I feel really honored to be here. And I just want to say I have faith in humanity to be able to solve these problems. And so I'm taking a very optimistic uh, view of the future here. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, you, you've, you've said you've said it all. Um, and I thank um, Alyssa, your uh, adept uh, facilitation of this conversation and all the participants, the challenging questions um, and the co challenging comments in the chat. Uh, it's, it, it is going to be hard, and, but I feel like we, uh, we always rise to the occasion uh, to solve big challenges with innovation and um, with kindness and um, smart thinking and listening to each other and really acknowledging that, yes, people are nervous about the future and how we will make this transition, and I, I get that. Um, but I also believe we can do it uh, and we have the technology and we have the innovation and we have the spirit uh, to do it right. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the glass half full uh, camp as well. <laughs>well we are about to wrap up again thank you to the panelists for joining us really appreciate this conversation and encourage folks to stay connected to the work that we're doing there will be more opportunities to hear from experts on the issue and and so stay connected with us um, and encourage you to participate in the process um, there's ways to provide input um, that is how our democracy works it is as strong as we make it so part of our responsibility as people who care about the Pacific Northwest West and care about salmon, Waikanish, is we need to be part of the process. Ask the hard questions, um, bring your good heart, your great minds, and, and let's, let's um, sit down and, and talk about things because change is coming. Climate change is real, and we need to be resilient moving forward in the future and, and plan for the changes that are already upon us. That is our responsibility to think about what we are going to leave behind our legacy um, for our children, for our grandchildren, and for the future. And, and I always am reminded about that when I talk to people from back home about what will we leave behind. And so I'm thinking about, um, for me personally, but I'm also thinking about this for you and for all of us um, so that we have a bright future for those that are here our little ones and those yet to come. So thank you and stay connected. Let's walk forward together. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>